This video was kindly sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, but more of that later. At Tankfest at Bovington, as well as tanks and living history displays, tanks and armoured cars and tanks, First World War tanks, tanks, Second World War tanks, tanks, modern tanks, engineering vehicles, tanks, a Lindy Beige meet and greet. I'll be honest, that was a bit weird. Tanks, reenactors, tanks, jeeps, tanks, battle displays and tanks. There was also an exhibition of tanks that could have been or yet could be. Let's start with the oldest. If you visit the British Museum, you will be able to see Assyrian reliefs depicting what some say were the inspiration for the wooden horse of Troy, mobile siege towers with battering rams. These images date to around 700 BC. Some have four wheels and move up steep ramps, and others have six, as shown here, and are clearly armoured. And this is the model maker's interpretation of those images. Do you think he got it right? The armour is wickerwork panels, some covered in wet leather to stop it all burning. A leather curtain protects the men at the bottom, who push it forward and wield the ram, and above them a place for soldiers to huddle in, waiting to dash up a ladder and into the tower and into action. But it's not really a tank, is it? From the period of AD 100 to 300 we have the Testudo, which just means tortoise. Some, the Testudo Arietaria, had rams hanging from ropes and rocked back and forth by teams of men, but others were just mobile roofs for getting men close to the enemy town's walls. Literary evidence suggests a layer of wet seaweed in between layers of leather to keep the roof fireproof. They were not huge, as the figure for scale shows you, and this model has an incomplete outer layer to show the structure beneath. Still stretching the definition of tank here, I feel. This is for sieges, not open warfare. The Caro Ballister, on the other hand, could be used in open warfare. It was mobile enough. A Roman legion might have as many as 55 of these. That's one for every 100 men or so. There are some pictured on Trajan's Column, erected in AD 113. Our word catapult comes from the Greek catapeltes, literally shield penetrator. Yikes. They were small, probably drawn by mules, and I have to say I disagree with this reconstruction. It has four small wheels and no steering mechanism, which would be asking for trouble on rough terrain, and has a thick, solid rear wall that would get in the way, and no way to pivot the weapon for quick aiming. This one on Trajan's column clearly has two large wheels, far better suited to the job. These two appear to be about to shoot, suggesting that they shot forwards without dismounting. This model seems to have been based on this much later engraving from 1552. But at least it's more like a tank. An unknown artist, probably German, in about 1480 drew this thing. The exhibition calls it the Boarhead Combat Vehicle. It is pushed rather than pulled by horses, and although it could be steered, it would be fiendishly difficult to keep it going straight. They did have breech loaders, so the crew wouldn't have to get out to reload the front cannon, but there's no way to aim the main gun, and the noise and smoke inside would have been horrendous, just from the smaller guns firing to the sides. In a siege, the horses would be vulnerable, and in open battle it would be very slow. No. But I, I do like a tank with dormer windows. We don't see that enough. 1485 now, the last year of the medieval period, if you're British, and Leonardo da Vinci drew this design for a tank. It had thick armour and 20 cannon. Turret? One gun in a turret to aim? No, just have one gun for every direction the target could be in. He reckoned eight men would have been able to move this. Eight demigods would have struggled. He said it was for sending ahead of the infantry to give them supporting fire. A ladder led up to a lookout's post at the top. Good luck seeing through all that smoke that would be funnelled up towards him. Leo's design for the crank handle and gears had a major flaw. Cranking the handle would have made the wheels turn in opposing directions. The Tank Museum at Bovington has a larger model on permanent display, and it has generously ironed out that kink by shifting one gear to the outer side of one wheel. So, Leonardo, you were very clever, but this tank design is rubbish. 1500 now, and a German knight called Ludwig von Eib designed this gun cart. It could be towed by a horse until needed for action, and then you could turn the horse around and have it push instead, while the enemy obligingly refrained from shooting at it. At the front, the chirpy little cherub of a gunner oh, look at him, he's loving it, was safe behind a wooden shield and could blaze away with deadly effect. 
it was probably meant to be a breech-loading swivel gun. I saw that front bit as a blade to keep the enemy at bay, but the model maker has interpreted that as a one-shot crossbow and hasn't given the gunner, oh, bless him, anywhere to sit. Ludwig also designed this thing. Now, something we learned from Mad Max films is that everything is improved by adding spikes. So this has a high score there, and it has a vast number of cannons. As you can see, it's utterly festooned in cannons, something like 72 of them. The spears, even if they are just fixed in place, might deter intruders, and as for the cannons, it strikes me that the idea might have been to have so flipping many of them that you fired each one only once, and by the time you'd gone round and fired them all, the battle would be over. It would be extraordinary for a modern tank to fire 72 times in one engagement. Many don't carry that many shells. There's hardly room for these overlapping horses, so there couldn't be many men inside, and those horses would be extremely unhappy once the shooting started. Not a practical design, but it's good to see that sloping armour was already understood. Ludo drew another one! This time it's some sort of armoured personnel carrier, complete with camouflage. No panicking horses this time, the crewmen have to push it themselves. Thick wooden walls for armour, with a couple of loopholes each side for shooting, and pointed prow for smashing into enemy formations or knocking aside barriers, apparently. Six wheels with two in line ahead at the front. This model shows no means for the men inside to push it, however. I, I suppose he could roll it down a hill. And it's a fourth one from Ludwig, popular chap at this exhibition. He was a very experienced soldier who fought in many European wars, went out of the Holy Land and ended up with his own castle before writing treatises in about 1500. This is his picture of his tank concept, and it requires a fair bit of interpretation. Exactly what shape is that top platform? How exactly are those guns at the front and back arranged? He might have been a good soldier, but his depiction of perspective was rubbish. He seems to have decided that the shape of a corsac was the ideal one for repelling close assault. Personally, I see all those spiky bits as liabilities. If just one snags on a bush or fold of land, then this underpowered vehicle would be stuck. Archers on the top might have had a decent freedom of movement, but the men underneath struggling with the weight of them and the armour and the cannon would be having a miserable time. I can believe it possible to move something like this on a good metalled road, but across country? Yeah, forget it. Forwards now to the geometrically precise plans of 1769, drawn up by the French Ministry of War. This was an attempt to harness steam power for use as a military gun tractor. This is also France's claim to having invented the automobile. The main snag was that the engine was so heavy and inefficient that it could move nothing more than itself. Also, it could run for no more than 15 minutes, then needed to be refilled with water and then brought back up to pressure. It was far slower than walking. Personally, I wouldn't want to go into battle immediately behind a thin-walled, high-pressure vessel filled with scalding hot steam. The drive was through the single front wheel, so grip wasn't marvellous, which might explain how he managed to crash into a wall in 1771. Its designer, Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, may not have been the inventor of the automobile, that was Carl Benz, yeah. but he does have a strong claim to have invented the motorised traffic oh. accident. <laughs> 1855 now, and the Industrial Revolution has taken off in Britain, and James Boydell has invented a practical steam tractor with footed wheels, and James Cowan applied this to warfare, using efficient steam engines and modern steel plate armour, modern guns and... rotating scythes, because... Boudicca! Legend has it that the barbarity of these additions was what caused Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister of the day, to reject the proposal. I look at it and I see a horseshoe crab. The Kraken awakes. A submarine. Oh, a Bobby's helmet. And a crushing victory over the French. This actually would have been able to move across country, but crew conditions would have been horrendous, the scythes were a silly idea, and gun aiming more than a little approximate. 1903, and H.G. Wells designs the land ironclad. Ironclads existed at sea already, so why not on land? Again, he used footed wheels, or ped rails, a proven design to prevent sinking in soft ground. This design inspired Winston Churchill, who championed the idea of the tank. 
There's no main gun, it's more of an infantry transporter with little loopholes for firing from. Oh, bang, two, three, 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 in, two, three, close, two, three. Wells considered steam power the obvious choice. You wouldn't want to be next to a petrol tank with explosives flying around. They would have been very heavy and slow. I'm not sure why the roof is so tall. Possibly this was just force of habit, familiarity with rain-shedding roofs on buildings. H.G. Wells. Yes, he's a more significant figure than perhaps you realise. We all know him as a very famous and influential science fiction writer, you know, War of the Worlds and all that, but perhaps you didn't know that he's often quoted for his uh, philosophy of politics and he's also one of the fathers of wargaming. Yes, he wrote one of the first ever wargaming books. It was called Little Wars. Didn't have any rules for tanks in it. I'm going to be forgiving, though, because there weren't any tanks in his day. Anyway, I've been learning more about him in a, in a lecture uh, from The Great Courses Plus, which is my sponsor. So doesn't that all fit together nicely? Uh, the course was called How Great Science Fiction Works, and it starts with the likes of uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, then you've got your... Um, uh, oh, sorry, what? Oh, you don't know what? Uh, sorry, OK, fair enough. I should tell you what The Great Courses Plus is, other than merely my sponsor. It's a, a, an online uh, lecture service. You become a subscriber and then you get access to thousands, over 11,000 last time I looked, of lectures on all sorts of topics, uh, Darwinian evolution, how to draw history and sci-fi. And I know that a lot of my uh, viewers are interested in sci-fi. Uh, they're based uh, quite near Washington, which is a pretty handy place to be because uh, it makes it easy for them to team up with, uh, say, the Smithsonian, which is based in Washington, and, and um, uh, the National Geographic also has an HQ in, yes, you guessed it, Washington. And, of course, you've got the Ivy League universities in that area. And now you may think that Ivy League university just means prestigious USA university, but ah, no. It's a sporting uh, definition. They're all in one fairly small geographical area by USA standards, which makes it practical for them to compete against each other in sporting uh, competitions. So it's actually a sports-based and not academic-based uh, definition. But they are, I'm sure, jolly good universities. Anyway, so a lot of the lecturers uh, on The Great Courses Plus come from them. Um, and uh, anyway, so where was I? So you've got your Mary Shelley, you've got your Jules Verne, you've got your H.G. Wells, and then he goes on to the, the, the Pulp Fiction stuff, the, you know, the, uh, like the Buster Crab Saturday morning serial stuff. Uh, what's that? Flash Gordon and um, Buck Rogers. And then you get your harder science fiction, like your Isaac Asimov, and then more up to date, you've got your cyberpunk, all the various genres that you would expect. And he deals with certain themes as well, like aliens and invasion and religion in sci-fi. Uh, ah, but I know what some of you are worried about. How, how are his moves? Has he got the moves? How are his gestures? You know, has he got some good scholar's cradles? Well, let's have a quick look. Um, he opens there with a, a basic prowl, which is fine. And, uh, oh, yep, yeah, and a, a count off. Uh, yep, yeah, all looking quite comfortable here. Some basic parallel waving, but it's good. And, uh, oh, and into an interlace there. So, yeah, I think this guy knows his stuff. Uh, later on in the same lecture, a nice pulsed front cage there. So, uh, yeah, I think you're in safe enough hands. So, the Great Courses Plus. How do you get your hands on these lectures? Well, you can, my, my viewers, get them for free, at least for a short trial period. If you go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige, you'll find out all about that trial period offer. You could actually just click the link in the description of this video, which is much, much easier. Anyway, The Great Courses Plus, thank you very much for sponsoring me. And now back to tanks. 1915. The British Landship Committee designs an armoured railway carriage on pedrails. It was really a troop transporter more than a tank and could carry an impressive 70 soldiers. It never went into production, but the Mark IX heavy tank, as described in one of my other videos, was a very similar idea and did get made. Over to Russia now in 1915 during the First World War and what must have been the biggest wheel on a tank ever. The Tsar tank. This thing was an astonishing 30 feet tall and 40 feet wide. The idea was that if you had a wheel big enough, it could just roll across a trench. Each wheel was driven by its own British aircraft Sunbeam petrol engine, and the smaller wheel on the stalk at the back was there for balance and steering. It had guns in the side sponsons, and more were planned to be added to the central belly. So, did it work? No. They built one prototype and it was rubbish. The rear wheel kept getting stuck and the front ones weren't powerful enough to pull it out. And the whole thing was a colossal artillery target. It doesn't exist anymore. It was broken up for scrap in 1923. 
1917 now, and the Yanks give it a go. One of these things was actually built, and it has a turret with guns, so it's definitely a tank. The hull is an upside-down ship's hull, and it is moved by a Best Track Machine Model 75 steam tractor underneath it. At the front, there's supposedly a wire cutter, useful for modern warfare. With a single wheel at the front, low ground clearance, and a pointed prow, this would almost certainly have become stuck in the muds of Flanders pretty quickly. But uh, thanks for joining in, America. The only military use it was put to was recruiting for the war effort in California. 1918, and this American design uses the miracle of electricity. The design appeared in Electrical Experimenter magazine, which featured real and fantastic designs. This had no heavy armour to slow it down, but instead it would evade enemy fire by whipping along at a dreamed of 37 miles per hour, thanks to its electric engines. The side-suspended gun turrets would have swung all over the place, making aiming a fun challenge, and the idea was also to drop bombs from these. It would be kept stable by a gyroscope whooshing around the central axis, and slight alterations to the course of this would enable steering. Beyond the Thunderdome. Strangely, no one ever built one. 1936 and the Tumbleweed Tank, invented by a Texan called A.J. Richardson, who published his design in Popular Mechanics magazine. Its ball shape enabled it to be small and strong. The inner section was supposedly stable and gas-tight, important against poisons and the two outer hemispheres rotated independently so it could steer. It had an anti-aircraft machine gun pointing skywards, and three more machine guns would wreak havoc amongst the foes and... Uh, friends of the crew. AJ had neglected to add any means of seeing outside the tank, which would probably have proven a problem. The Germans came up with something similar and actually built some, the mysterious Kugelpanzer, or ball tank. These were one-man things sold to the Japanese and used in Manchuria, possibly for reconnaissance. Next to nothing is known about them, but one that was captured in 1945 is on display now in the Kubinka Tank Museum in Russia. The first thing I thought of when I saw it was this prototype Dalek, which is on display in Copenhagen's Danish War Museum. 1942 now, and the Soviet Empire develops a flying tank the Antonov A-40 glider tank. The idea was that a powerful aircraft would tow the gliding tank behind it and then let it go. The crew, in the tank, knees knocking in terror presumably, would then deftly glide the tank into a gentle landing, shed the wings and spring into action. So, did it work? No. They built one, but found that they didn't have an aircraft powerful enough to get it properly airborne. The towing aircraft, a Topolev TB3, struggled and was forced to cut the glider loose. It seems, though, that the seven-ton gliding T-60 tank plummeted with a fair amount of style, although uh, to get it light enough they had to remove most of the fuel and the headlamps, ammunition and the armament. So springing into action was never really on the menu. The British had a go at a similar idea with the Baines Bat, a tailless design. The prototype flew very well in 1943, but it never carried a tank into action. It was decided instead to go with large gliders that could carry all sorts of things, including small tanks, inside their fuselages. No talk of tanks that never were would feel right without something German and wildly excessive. So, get ready to feast your viewing eyes on the 1942 Krupp Land Cruiser. You may have heard of the farcically oversized mouse, meaning mouse, uh, which weighed a laughably impractical 185 tons. Well, the ratter, meaning rat, would have been a thousand tons at least. The armour was up to 14 inches thick. The main turret was the type designed for the uh, Gneisenau class battleship, or possibly the unused turrets made for the Scharnhorst refit. These would have 11-inch naval guns. See those little turrets there? Those are the turrets of the mouse with 128mm main guns. You also see there the anti-aircraft turrets from Verbalvins. The designs, apparently, showed bays inside for two motorcycles for scouting, storerooms, an infirmary and an inside loo. Did they ever build it? No! Even if they had had the resources to build it, it would have been useless. How would you get it into battle? 
It's too big for rail transport, and no bridge would be strong enough to carry it, and it was wider than a road. Once the enemy knew where you were, and it's not a stealth weapon, he could then fly over it and drop massive bombs on it. The end. Was it even ever a serious design? Well, given how much room you need under a naval turret like that for all the rotation mechanisms and ammunition handling rooms, which in a battleship are as tall as about a five-story building, very probably not. The TV-8, a sci-fi tank of the future? No, this was Chrysler's design from 1956, the nuclear age. It was thought likely that small tactical nuclear weapons, perhaps fired by tanks, would feature on the battlefield. Some war game rules from the era covered this. Here you are watching a 1953 test in Nevada of a nuclear shell fired from a gun. What would tanks have to be like in a world of nuclear weapons? Well, for one thing, you'd have to protect the crew from the searing flash of an atomic explosion. So you'll see that there are no vision slits, and instead all viewing would be through cameras. Given the state of video technology in 1956, it's difficult to think that that would have worked well. Supposedly, the shape of the turret and the small hull was to help protect against the air pressure wave from an atomic bang. All the crew sat in the hermetically sealed turret, which weighed 15 tonnes, and the hull 10 tonnes, so it would have been a bit wobbly. The gun was nothing special, just a smoothbore 90mm. That's a remote-controlled 50 cal on the top mini turret. It was meant to be amphibious, with a water jet engine at the rear of the turret, and the hull and turret could be separated for air transport. Various main engines were proposed, including a nuclear-powered one. Never built. The Ground X Vehicle, a design for the future, by the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Perhaps this is the future of tanks, small, light, fast, with sensors picking up incoming threats early enough for the vehicle to take evasive action. This design has a one-man crew and a largely automated main turret. Even now there are devices that can aim a gun accurately on the calculated source of incoming fire. It reminds me of the B-1 battle droid from The Phantom Menace. If it proves as deadly as those, pew, 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 we're all as safe as houses. Pew, pew, we are a bit pew. rubbish. So there you have it. 21 proto-tanks and tanks that never were. And in most cases, probably never would have been, nor should have been. Bye.